All right. We've got another great guest from all the way down under with us, Shane Simonson. Thanks for joining us, Shane. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for the opportunity to come and say hi. You're welcome. Oh, this will be fantastic. I, I mean, I, I love the sound of your of your book and your Substack and and the stuff you're doing there uh, in your in your farming. And Darren, you know, Darren's just moved to a pretty sort of pretty big property. Not that he has like full access, but he's got you know. It's just interesting now that you know Darren's kind of found his place on a big, big you know, not too big, but an acreage. So I mean, I'm I'm just interested, and I've moved into a new place. So I'm interested to to hear a little bit more about that kind of like, you know, taming the apocalypse, like your book. But then we're also going to get into like other bigger picture stuff as well. So brilliant, yeah. I, I we, this can go in so many different directions. So so let's see what we um what we run into. Where where do you want to start? Do you want to start with like your specific work, or do you want to talk about like, you know, the start of agriculture and and uh, some you mentioned in in your email. And Darren will love this because this is one of Darren's favorite topics. And I don't think he knows that this is going to come up, but um, uh, Eugene McCarty, McCarty, Eugene McCarty, McCarty. 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 Yeah. yeah, the the hybridism, because you're kind of involved in this stuff a little bit. So, I mean, do, do you want, where do you want to start? So I'm more on the plant side of yeah. the, the hybridization, speciation, domestication side of things. And it's a lot less controversial there because it's observed to happen both in uh, human controlled systems in, in agriculture and horticulture, um, but it's very well established that it happens in nature as well too, that many, many plant groups uh, regularly create new species through hybridization. Right. So why would that not apply to other ones then? Uh, well, with animals, it's there are examples that are definitely proven um so uh, there's a uh, liger <laughs> uh, yeah no, no, not just like a, a an individual example of a cross but a whole new functional species in the ecosystem appearing so a really good example of that recently um so there's invasive honeysuckle in the united states and a fly suddenly appeared in people's field observations that was feeding on the fruits of the honeysuckle so they're like where did this thing come from like how did we not see it before doesn't come from where honeysuckle originally came from it just popped out of nowhere so they studied the genetics of it and found that it was a hybrid of two other fly species that feed on other fruits and they managed to recreate that hybridization in the lab and then stabilize it to something equivalent to what they see in the wild um even with darwin's finches recently one of them got blown from one island to another where there were none of its um con specifics for mating with so it shacked up with a different species of darwin's finches and produced a hybrid offspring that started breeding amongst themselves you know no way Adam and eve style garden of eden don't ask too many questions wow. um but they managed to stabilize into a small unique population wow and darwin that's awesome that it happens right in darwin's backyard there i mean yeah. that should that should have um, ruffled some feathers and Pardon. I believe that there's hybridization of coyotes that have stabilized into a new population in the US. And it's just, it, it's the kind of thing that when it's happening, nobody notices it. And then suddenly the population's there and people just shrug and say, you know, it's just, it's just always been there. Well, how does this happen in the fly example with, with like, with a new flower or the, or you mentioned the, the honeysuckle thing, like how did they, so did it, was I it want to explain the birds and the bees to you, Graham? <laughs> Um, so with complex organisms, that. as long as you can get past all of the behavioral and genetic barriers, then anything's possible. You just need penetration. <laughs> <laughs> no, right? but I mean, that's what boils down to at the end of the day. And then it has to take seed, I guess. And then there's the difference between whether it's viable or not. But, yeah. but was there a need like, was... for that? Uh, well, see, here's the thing. So what it's this is a theory that i'm coming up with hybridization probably happens a lot more often than we realize but usually the hybrid offspring doesn't have a viable niche in the ecosystem and it's competing against two very well defined very finely tuned species that monopolized all of the resources that it could potentially tap into that's so, fascinating so usually they'll back cross to one of those parent populations and you, it, it creates a bit of a connection between the two species, but the evidence gets disappeared really quickly. It's wow. only when you have massive um, environmental catastrophe, like everything's up in the air and changing, that those hybrids have an opportunity to latch onto a new niche. 
Or so like the fly, just honey fuck any other fly probably when it's like mating time. You know what I mean? They could probably yeah. barely even see what's going on. Yeah, well, uh, they usually use pheromones, but again, it's all up to preferences and who's available at the moment. That's, uh, uh, I think it's the equivalent of being, uh, what do they call it, prison gay? <laughs> if there's only flies of another species around or birds of another species around, you're more likely to just, you know, give it a go and see what happens. But, but the niche the was the honeysuckle, part. right? Wasn't the niche the honeysuckle, though? Yeah, so in that example, that was the new niche that was being unexploited, and once these two species hybridized, that highly mixed up genetic diversity of the hybrid population had an opportunity to refine itself towards uh, using that new resource. So what came first, though? Like the, the invasive honeysuckle or the hybrid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like what came, what first? came into, into the region first. And it the, probably was invasive because it didn't have species like the new fly. Oh, so but I mean, where's the, it's so fascinating because this kind of... I don't really think this fits in with evolution, but there was a trigger or like a morphic resonance. Like I, it almost fits in with Sheldrake's thing that there's a new, there's a new invasive species of something and it needs something to tame it. Um, pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. And it's interesting too, because there's a pattern in particularly invasive plants. Often they're introduced into a region and they just sit around doing nothing for hundreds of years. Um, they, they just, you know, they, they've, escaped into the wild and there's a few of them around in a limited location and people are like and if you look around the ecosystem there's like thousands of introduced species like this just sitting there practically doing nothing and then suddenly something happens and then they explode and spread everywhere and often these explosive um processes are a result of hybridization of two distinct strains within that one species as defined by science so, for example, um, you see this in agriculture all the time, and this is what we talk about a lot with the Landrace Gardening uh, podcast, uh, Going to Seed. Um, I can take two distinct strains of pumpkins, and you can you can get away with growing them, and they, they do okay, but when you hybridize them and allow them to mix up their genes from that early hybrid, hybrid population, you get this explosion of diversity and you can apply selective pressures and end up with a, a far superior variety for your local conditions. And this seems to happen with introduced wild weedy plants as well too, that you'll get one introduction that like can barely hang on in a really limited region. And then a second introduction comes in and the two of them collide. And that's when you get the explosion into an invasive species. And something similar to this happened in Australia. I mean, we've got so many weedy species here, but our lantana, is this huge, shrubby, spiky, beautifully flowered thing that loves growing in the understory of when you log down a rainforest. So we've got vast acreages covered with this thing. But the variety of lantana that we have here doesn't exist in South America where the parent species came from. It's actually a hybrid of three or four um, almost sterile ornamental varieties that managed to like barely get their pollen into each other when they were growing in the garden together, produce a few fruits, that the birds then started spreading into the um, into the forests, and um, yeah, if you look at the history of agriculture, pretty much every crop and most livestock has a hybrid origin. When you go back to where it was first domesticated, wow, Darren, do you got any comments or questions? You're I kind of well. I think it. it's a combination of all of those things. You know, hybridization, evolution, and uh, the other one. I forget what the other one is now, but we were just talking about talking about it. You know, I think it's all three. Why not? Residents, or? yeah, morphic yeah. residents. Yeah, it's all three, and probably and then some. Probably some extra shit mixed in there too. So that's Sweet. my my take on it. I mean, I you still won't convince me that we're not from pig or monkeys fucking pigs. So I, that's where all the evidence seems to point. Well, I, I find McCarthy's work to be absolutely fascinating. I've reached out to him, but I haven't heard a, a response yet. I think he's, anyway, I'm guessing that he's had a lot of pushback and criticism and he's just over it. So he stopped putting his head out into public, which I understand. Um, I'm open-minded about the hypothesis. And I think he is too. If you read closely his work, he isn't advocating this. He isn't arguing it is true. He is saying it is a hypothesis worth investigating. And that's a, a distinction the that other, culture has me, a hard time dealing with. To me, that is more plausible than because it's either that or they like 
The other thing is they maybe they mixed up some monkeys and some pigs, some aliens did that. Maybe it was the Anunnaki. Or they made us to make some slave, some gold or whatever the fuck. I don't, you know, that to me sounds nuts compared to just like I've seen videos because I've been going off about this for almost a decade now. <laughs> and so now people just send me like a video of a, a chimp or a little bonobo just pounding on a little baby pig. And, uh, you know, is that viable? Maybe it's viable. I don't know. If they know, they ain't telling us. I mean, there's you hear the rumors of the pig man or this or that. I mean, even Seinfeld had a play on the pig man. But well, uh, it's one of the limitations of our scientific model. So um, our scientific theories and our, our methods and our culture came from physics and chemistry, where the idea was that something needed to be reproducible in a laboratory. So if you take the same ingredients or the same, you know, proton beam or something and set it up the right way, you'll get exactly the same results. And biology doesn't play like that. So if you have a situation like a monkey pig hybrid, where it's only one in a million embryos is actually viable, then you can't necessarily just reproduce that in a laboratory unless you can reach the necessary scale to, you know, have that lucky event. So in, in biology, because once you have one thing succeed, it can reproduce itself. It means that it opens the doors to something that functions like a miracle, that it happened just once. And it's not easy to just make it happen again, but the consequences propagate from that point forward. Right. Really so you don't need them. You, the, you could have it happen 99 times and, you know, the offspring aren't viable, but then all of a sudden it gets the mixture, right? You know, a, 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 a congress of apes stumbles across a, a herd of wild pigs and, you know, whatever happens, happens. And all of a sudden a bunch of pigs have, you know, I don't know, because you got to get a few of them going in the beginning to, to get the species going. But, you know, even the Bible says just two. So maybe just two. Maybe it's twins, a boy and a girl. Holy shit. What happened, what happened in the pen stays in the pen? <laughs> Well, I well, mean, I don't see, think they had pens. But, th this is know. the interesting thing, though. So nor <laughs> normally hybridization leading to new species in nature relies on catastrophe of like opening or or massive changes in the ecosystem that, that open up new niches. So most of the time you end up in a relatively static state in terms of speciation and you just get these occasional punctuated equilibriums where suddenly everything changes. Human culture has the capacity to both create and nurture these hopeful monsters. So when you first hybridize something, you just don't get instant success. Often the first few generations are a step backwards in terms of vigor compared to the parent species. But if you, uh, if you nurture them through that difficult adolescence into something new, then it opens up all sorts of possibilities and you don't have to wait for an asteroid to hit the planet in order to get major speciation events. You wow. can do it within, you know, the the protection of humanity that understands and values this process. Wow. Well, there's you... a lot of evidence of asteroids too. So, I mean, that boat, that isn't like a, a uh, if anything, that would almost make it more plausible than ruining it for me. It's like, okay, well, we talk to people all the time that say asteroids are hitting this bitch all the time or the sun's going off and torching the place. I mean, it honestly seems like a pretty terrible place to live sometimes when it's it, not it's, great. It's just terrible enough to make it interesting. <laughs> That's the way and I look make, at it. And, and to make you dig some tunnels so that maybe you have somewhere to go and when the shit pops off. I mean, I, I almost think that they they were hiding in tunnels and under, under the earth for... You know, there's actually a few sci-fi. You'd like this because you write fiction too. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's some really cool sci-fi theories about like all the planets that that, that mainly, it's it's just uh, normal that it's all inside the planet. You know, under tunnels and catacombs and stuff, and it's rare that things evolve on the outside because of the hazards of the the outside world. You know. Well, on that topic, on my Substack a while ago, I did a post called the the diminishing returns of collapse. And I actually looked at all of the mass extinction events through history and also collapses in human civilization and made the argument that the whole system is getting better at enduring and recovering from these disasters 
if you actually look at the early mass extinctions and the early civilization collapses, they're much more severe and take longer to come back from than the more recent ones. And it makes sense. Like if you keep hitting a complex system with the same stress, eventually it's going to find ways of adapting to it. Right. And this, this idea that we have to be a multi-planetary species in order to deal with these things is complete rubbish. Like the middle of Antarctica is more hospitable on the day that an asteroid has hit the planet than the surface of Mars is on a good day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like you've, but... you've still got a magnetic field, you've still got a breathable atmosphere, you've still got gravity around about the right level. Did so, your analysis did your analysis of, of collapses and catastrophes include pole shifts at all? Like how, what about that? If that if that's a thing that actually does happen, because I'm not sure if that's sort of a real thing or not, but people say that the the, the magnetic pole is slipping right now as it is. Like yeah, they're they're an interesting kind of intermediate case. So asteroid collisions and huge volcanic events leave big signatures in the like hundreds of millions of years range. And in the thousands of years range, we've got you know, uh, archaeological and occasionally written evidence of what civilization collapses were. But the pole shifts are something that's kind of an intermediate time scale, and the evidence for that isn't as good. Um, you do have some cases of, um, I remember seeing uh, microfossils showing high levels of mutation in uh, plants at the time, like their pollen was getting all janked up. And um, that was probably from higher UV levels during a pole shift or, or some other um, impact that, that messed up the atmosphere and, and stripped off the ozone layer. Wow. So, so yeah. we, before we get into that, I, I want to ask a question before I forget to ask it, but about the hybridization of the plants. And so mm -hmm. what you do then with the plants, like I've, I don't really know how this works, but is, do you do the same thing as nature does or how close is your process to nature? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I work on a, a bit of context. So I'm in Australia. I'm a bit of a doomer. I think that the oil powered industrial system that we have is running on empty and it's going to contract and simplify. And I think as, as time has gone by, the devil's in the details about how you think that's going to play out and nobody has a real idea. Um, but I think most people are coming onto that feeling, but we, we feel like we're at the top of a roller coaster, that sick feeling before the plunge starts. Um, who knows what that plant is going to be like. But in Australia, we went from hunter-gatherer culture to industrial agriculture with nothing in between. Right. We don't have a history of pre-industrial agriculture that, you know, fed civilization for thousands would that be of years. The, would that be the same as us then too? Uh, you're probably similar. Yeah, depending on where you are in Canada. Um, so my challenge is assembling a range of biological resources that could support a post-industrial civilization in my particular bioregion. Because at this time in history, it's relatively easy to find and collect those resources. Like we've got a, a global information system, postage system, and communication system that has never happened before. And it's the biggest, most complicated machine that we've ever made. And there's already signs of it falling apart at the margins. So I figured that's the thing I can do in my time in history that in another 20, 30, 100 years may not be as easy for people to do. So I'm doing it now while I can and um, trying to find what actually wants to grow in my particular location without all sorts of industrial inputs to keep it going and productive. Yeah, that gets into the whole topic. I want to ask you about your in zero input, you know, what yes. that means. But but let's get back to the hybridization. To the hybridization. Part. So. Yeah. There's a spectrum. At one end, you just take established strains of an already domesticated crop and you do a variety trial to figure out the ones that like your conditions and then you allow them to mix and you go through, you start the selection process for them thriving in your local conditions. But at the other extreme, I've got some novel domestication projects as well. So a good example of this is um, we have a local uh, conifer tree called the bunya nut. And it's this amazing thing from the Jurassic. It gets uh, cones on it the size of basketballs covered in these giant spines. And they're full of chestnut-like seeds that are full of starch. So the local indigenous people used to have giant feasts, like eating these things. Um, but I'm looking at them thinking, could they be domesticated? Um, so I've brought in, I, I, I've assembled um, a diversity of the local bunya nuts that grow all around me. But I've also brought in another species from South America from when Gondwana land was all connected. 
um, called the piranha pine, and it comes from southern Brazil, which has a very similar climate to us. So my life's work in the you know, 20 good years that I've got left on the farm is to mature these two species and do a mass hybridization between them and then take those hybrid seeds and send them all over the world because they have the potential to grow everywhere from the tropics down to probably about zone seven. And there's a cold tolerant species from Chile, the monkey puzzle, which I think can push the hybrid swarm down to about zone five. And this species is, it, it's got so much potential to be like a major tree staple crop that can be integrated with livestock at the same time. Wow. Yeah. 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 So how does that, does that physically happen? Like you physically are splicing these things together and then how does nature do it then? Um, it's just, it's just hybridization. So they're wind pollinated and yeah. I'm really, really lucky because the piranha pines have separate male and female trees. So when they start maturing, I'm going to be killing all of the male piranha pines and just leaving the females in amongst all of the bunyas. So the seeds coming off the female piranha pines have to be hybrids. I'm setting up the conditions where hybridization has to happen. Wow. Okay. Interesting. And, and, and nature just does that sort of naturally. Yeah. 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 But humans can be a catalyst in that process. We can be a symbiont to shape the ecosystem. And I mean, this was happening all around the planet before industrialization. So the, the forest gardens of Eastern U S had extensive interventions from the indigenous Indian people. Yeah. They were selecting and moving and thinning um, tree crops all over that region for thousands of years. Right, right. It's, and similar yeah, things happening in the Australia. World, right? Really, I yeah, mean, all over the world. the world. Like at, at some point, yeah. So then, man, there's so many questions I have. But maybe, maybe we'll stick to the young, like the cataclysm part and the younger dryest before we get more into the zero input stuff. But mm. so I look. I love what you put there about, uh, you know, you, you, uh, you, you look at the, you know, the chaos that happened after that Holocene to or the, to this radical new way of life, this agriculture, mm. um, that the only, the only remainable sustainable resources after industrialization runs its course, it will be biology and culture. So do you, do you want to expand on that a bit more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the civilizations that rose up after that Holocene chaos, they were built on accidental biotechnology. So wheat, for example, is a three-way hybrid of these wild grasses that have dust-like seeds, like tiny, tiny little seeds that people were harvesting and eating them, but it was a huge amount of work for not much payoff. And by cramming those three genomes together, you create a crop which suddenly has so much of a return that it's worth transforming the whole landscape to grow it. And everything that came after that, the metallurgy, the, the giant monuments, literacy, government, religion, all of that was built on that one accidental biological happenstance. So my idea is that going forward, we're likely to have a, another period of climate chaos. Um, the CO2 levels are going up, which is going to change the rate at which different plants grow again. And I look at the next thousand does years. Does it slow any plants down or does it speed them all up? Like, is there plants uh, that more CO2 is bad for? So grasses are low carbon dioxide specialists. So in, in the lead up to the Holocene, Earth actually hit the lowest CO2 levels that it had ever had. And that was probably part of the contribution to the extinction of the megafauna, that a lot of the tundra just stopped growing because the CO2 got so low, um, even in places it was still relatively warm. And coming out of that, with the CO2 levels going back up again, grasses had an advantage um, in terms of being more productive because they had all of these mechanisms to use CO2 more efficiently. I suspect that the next jump in CO2 levels is probably going to open up broadleaf plants, um, including tree crops and perennial crops that were always around the margins, but I think they're going to become more useful in the next few thousand years and the grasses will lose their relative competitive advantage. So does that mean we could see the like the forestation of the prairies and the grasslands? I mean, the prairies are really just the grasslands. Yeah, well, it, it's interesting because a lot of those functional grasslands rely on uh, large animals moving around in huge herds to maintain them. And we've broken that system. Like we've killed off most of the megafauna uh, over most of the world. And that happened before industrialization and before civilization often. Um, and now our modern management system relies on putting fences everywhere and like water lines. And it, it's a really brittle 
system that relies on inputs that aren't going to be around for that much longer. So how those about, systems evolve in the future. You guys are really like, you guys, sorry, but you, sorry to interrupt. You guys are huge on cattle though. That stuff I feel like is going to just do fine. Uh, it, it'll probably remain a viable enterprise, but how we manage it is going to have to change when we don't have fences. Like it, a lot of the Great Plains of the US was only colonized after barbed wire fencing became cheap enough that you could put a line around a property and keep your livestock in. Um, before that time, that was kind of the, the early Wild West stage. You could ranch cattle, but you had to basically just follow them around the landscape and try and like nudge them in the direction of a market to get a, a payoff in the end. So that, that transformation in how the landscape was used is really, really interesting. Um, I, I'm hopeful that if we can get our act together, that we can domesticate a wider range of large animals to create mixed species herds to manage the landscape more effectively than just having cows. Wow. As seen on the TV show, 1885, or was it 1883? I can never get that right. Have you seen that? Uh, no, no, no. Tell they me about show, it. Oh yeah. They show, well, they show a great example of the, the trek out West and the cowboys bringing rat, like going out and getting the, um, um, a herd to follow the, the convoy out West, you know, it's, it's all about, all about that. And they mentioned the bar bar, they mentioned the fencing. That yeah. It's it completely changing. changed the like, culture. It's all changing because of the fencing. Now we have all this fencing and it's all changing. Like everybody's sort of getting it's their, a, their property. It, it's comparable to the enclosures of the common agricultural land that happened in Europe around the same time that was mostly driven by cheaper metal making it possible to have horse-drawn combines so you didn't have to have all of these peasants waiting around for most of the year to harvest all of the grain you could do it with a machine and you're like go away peasants i don't need you anymore huh that's fascinating but yeah so yeah. so much of all of that transformation is all dependent on having greater quantities of cheaper iron um, up until that point, you could make iron tools with wood and charcoal, but the growth rate of forests limited the amount of technology that you could have in society because there just wasn't enough metal to do it. Like a, a peasant would have, you know, an axe and a metal pot and a knife and a few nails and, and fasteners. And that was it. Like that was a lifetime supply of iron was all that the ecosystem could supply. But once coal became adapted for creating more iron, you had this explosion in cheap iron. And everything else that's happened after that has still been built on a foundation of cheap iron. And um, most of the world's good quality surface, easy to access coal resources have been used. Um, I saw a really good argument that the shift of industrial production to China was partially driven by them having the last large high quality coal resource left in Inner Mongolia that they hooked up to their system with rail lines that got sent out there relatively recently. And it's starting to show signs of stress in terms of the rate at which the coal can come out of it. Huh, that's interesting. Do you ever think about the why why we're so uh why wheat is not really healthy for us? Like if it's been around for so long, if it's one of the earlier things from that last sort of change after the cataclysm, why is it is it just the chemicals or like I because I always wonder like if that's such an old thing and, we, and we've been doing it for, we've been eating it for so long, it's made such a difference in us. Why isn't it, why do I have to fucking watch the bread that I, you know, like. So part, this is like such a multi-layered problem, but so going way back. So um, when you look, so there's genetic markers for your risk of gluten intolerance, for example, right, and yep. like full celiac disease is deadly. Like you die in childhood. And if you look at the genetic markers of early humans in the Middle East, they had the same rate of susceptibility to celiac disease as uh, people who've never eaten wheat traditionally. But it, as time went by and more and more wheat cultivation happened, those genes got weeded out of the population. Those children just didn't survive being fed nothing but bread for the first 12 years of their life. And it's when you get out to the outer edge of Europe, so Ireland and Scandinavia um, is where you get the highest rates of those genes because wheat arrived there last. Right. So there's We're this adaptation process. Out. We're still weeding them out. Yeah. And it goes even further back. I mean, like farmers, the early farmers increased the rate of amylase, the gene that allows you to digest more starch compared to hunter-gatherers. And if you go to the Inuit or the Maasai who eat almost no starch, they've got like one or two copies of that gene. 
if you go to Southeast Asia with like rice paddy people, they have 17 copies of that gene. And that kind of mutation can happen relatively quickly in a population that's under this constant metabolic pressure. And it makes wow. you wonder if humans still have capacity to adapt to, to new crops that are otherwise, you know, semi-edible today. Yeah, I mean, yeah. look at this. If we ate nothing but Twinkies and Ho-Hos for another 10,000 years, the people who tended to become obese and get diabetes and, you know, have all of these problems would be weeded out of the population over time if we didn't have, like, modern medicine propping them up. Yeah, that's fascinating because I did hear about that, that the stomach, our stomachs, the bio... The, the biome of our uh, stomachs is different. Like for Northern Europeans, for example, they can handle carbs differently than mm -hmm. those simple carbs differently. And, and the, the starches, I guess, compared to other, other people. Yeah. There's another weird example of that. Japanese people who eat a lot of seaweed, there's yeah. a microbe in their stomach that breaks down one of the carbohydrates from the seaweed. And it borrowed that gene from a uh, organism that lives in the ocean. Yeah, that's fascinating. So there's all these different levels that you can like adapt to completely different situations. And humans are like more adaptable than, well, modern humans are more adaptable in that way than any other creature that's turned up on the planet before. Yeah. We're, we're, we're a bit of a game changer. And I mean, that's happened before in history. Like the first plants that pumped out oxygen completely changed the chemical composition of the whole atmosphere. And the trilobites, when they first evolved, were the first species with cutting jaws and armored skeletons and there were all of these like weird blobby jelly type organisms that were starting to form bodies and the, when the trilobites emerged they just ate like 90 percent of those early families and wiped them out and we have no idea what they were we've just got these weird impressions in the mud is that the, the part of that cambrian explosion type thing yeah. Yeah, yeah 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 it was one of the first big um parts of the cambrian explosion they were the first segmented creatures that took over the uh, the whole oceans basically overnight so and then wasn't he, there a big wasn't there a big shift or gap after that then? Um, so it's weird. Like I look at the trilobites as being like the beta max of that body plan, and then all of these other creatures that independently evolved, like the the insects and the crustaceans, came up with similar solutions and eventually took over from the trilobites. So I wonder if humans are going to be a similar thing. Like we, our emergence probably relied on the state of the whole planet. Like this record low CO2 put the whole ecosystem into a kind of weird crisis state. And then humans emerged with this whole new set of behavioral adaptations. And then we're not a rampage. Um, I, I see us as more as a catalyst, like a transformative agent. Um, and you could almost view industrial civilization like a detritivore, like where... Um, so a really good comparison is when plants first evolved the ability to form wood, like lignin and cellulose and make huge bodies, it took about 10 million years for fungi to catch up and figure out how to break down this new substance. And for those 10 million years, there's just dead trees lying all over the planet. The CO2 levels plummeted and we had another like ice age and all of the coal beds that we have today were formed. So when fungi first appeared as detritivores, they like re-liberated all of that CO2 into circulation and like rebalanced the planet. And I almost wonder if humans are serving a similar oh. role in industrial civilization as this big bloom of a, a fermentation to like put things back into motion that have been locked up for, for tens of millions of years. There's too much <laughs> carbon dioxide, Shane. Haven't you got the memo? I'm paying tax on carbon because <laughs> there's too much. Well, so. here's the thing, like, I'm not that worried about the temperature implications of rising CO2. The far more interesting thing is that different plants photosynthesize at different rates, depending on the CO2 level. And grasses have dominated the planets for so long because the CO2 level was so low for so long. With it rising again, you've got deserts that are turning back into scrublands, like all of these shrubs are springing up in places that used to be too dry. They are still too dry. But what's changed is higher CO2 levels allow plants to use water more efficiently if they've got broad leaves. So it, it's ecosystems are just changing all over the place in all of these chaotic ways. And it's this invisible creeping thing where individual species hit thresholds of suddenly being more competitive one at a time. And there's no telling what's going to happen next. I suspect a lot of the woody um, invasives that are spreading through the US at the moment 
are suddenly taking off for this reason, that they've hit a key level of CO2 that allows them to, them to compete in a way that they couldn't before. What do you think about the, the abiotic oil theory? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it's true, but it's not just the amount of oil and where it comes from, but the rate at which it can flow into industrial civilization. Yeah. Um, it, it's not the tank, it's the tap. So, um, and also how far away that, that resource is as well too. So if there is abiotic oil, it's probably so deep and it comes to the surface so slowly that I can't see it making a difference to the the level of complexity that we've built with such a rapid increase in the rate at which we consume things. Right, right. So when I, do you think I, peak oil I, is? You must be a peak oil guy then. I am, I am. I, I think we're around about it now. Um, it's funny, like I, I kind of got set onto this uh, path back in the early 2000s when we led up to the GFC with that huge spike in oil prices and all of the community that had been talking about this issue that I was like participating in, theoildrum.com was like where all of the nerds went back then. Um, there were a lot of people like screaming that, you know, the whole system is going to like blow up and, you know, just disappear overnight. But there was a smaller, quieter crowd saying, no, it's probably going to be a low, long, slow, drawn out process. And I think they're proven to be right. There, there is likely to be periodic disasters and like stair step simplifications. Um, I mean, look at Lebanon, for example, recently, or Sri Lanka. These are small peripheral parts of the industrial you know, ecosystem that reach the point of being non-profitable and they just got cut off. Like they basically just got abandoned. And I wouldn't be surprised if Australia is in a similar position that we're so far away from everyone else that we're going to be one of the first ones that's just like it's not worth sending tankers to Australia anymore so we'll just keep doing industrialization in North America and just pretend that Australia doesn't exist um you Haiti Haiti's a great oil? example too you guys like it's right on your doorstep well oh, I mean at some point you just gotta leave leave the locals to the local stuff you know I mean it's just it's none of my business as long as I got a high enough wall then it's none of my business. I mean, I don't know that it's, it's, what do we do about Haiti? And, you know, is it, is it our problem? Do we go in there as, as the whites and be like, all right, boys, knock it off? Well, see, this is the way I imagine the industrial corporate global system functions. It looks at somewhere like Haiti and says, are there enough resources here to be worth investing? In getting it under control and extracting them and the last big wave of intervention in haiti was basically parasitic they were just stripping the country of the last things that they could grab and get out of there and it's basically uh, a, a dead zone at the moment and i don't agree with us doing that kind of stuff this economic hick man this resources i mean we've got so many natural resources in Canada that we could all be millionaires. Every Canadian could be a millionaire. We could be like Saudi princes, but we can't get, we can't get our shit together. But you know, some of these places when we're there fucking them up seems to be, you know, when the only time it's not totally fucked and, you know, I don't know what we can do about that other than, you know, at some point we just gotta, we gotta walk away. It seems crazy to me to have someplace I mean, we're sitting on top of so much oil here, we can't figure out a way to get it to market fast enough. So I just, mm -hmm. you know, this is, it's so far, we've got a refinery two hours away. Running out of energy is just not on my radar. Do you think, if anything, I could see more where we just stop? And you can already see sort of the things in place. You can see, you can see the sort of where it's, where the pipelines are going to get built to Eastern Canada and to Western Canada because eventually, in my lifetime, we're going to be burning Canadian oil all over all over this motherfucker, and we're going to be proud to do it. And it's going to be weird, but I don't see how how we do it any other way. So do you think this, like, well, I mean, well, we're lucky in a lot of senses because we're sitting on top of oil and on top of, you know, I'm in Wheatland County. So, I mean, mm -hmm. even obviously a lot of this extra weed is because they're pumping chemicals and this and that, but... 95% of the people are going to die. So I can survive on 5% of the wheat. And uh, hopefully some of the animals will come back. I mean, we're we're still pretty blessed in how much wildlife is running around here. I, I still don't, I think I could eke out a living on that. I feel like Australia is the same way in a lot of ways, but I never consider that you guys don't have any energy. I mean, that 
that would be a real concern that you guys could get shut off on energy because it can't be how much is it is, is gas there is it per liter there yeah, 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 it's relatively expensive um, compared to the US, but I mean, that's everywhere outside well, of like indeed. Kuwait and petro states. Um, so Australia has a lot of coal. Um, we're starting to frack gas, which is keeping our local gas relatively cheap, but we're exporting most of it at like bargain basement prices because we're, we're a, um, a, a resource extraction colony of the. So the you can system. turn that frack and stuff into gasoline. In theory, but Do we you can't have even... any refineries. You yeah, must have so... refineries. I'll give you an outline of where we are in Australia. So we produce about half of the oil that we consume, but it's mostly light fractions. So all of that gets sent to Singapore. We've shut down all of our refineries to get refined in Singapore, gets blended with heavier oil from like the Middle East and Indonesia, and then it comes back to us as finished product. So if we lose our shipping connection to Singapore or Singapore goes offline, our ability to create uh, fuel to like move trucking around is basically gone overnight and we recently oh. bought a strategic petroleum reserve our, our government thought ahead but it's in california that's almost inevitable to happen in the next 10 years maybe five yeah. i mean you must be like oh well we're just gonna run out of gas soon. I mean, well, how can you not? The global shipping, just without anything else, I don't see how global shipping survives the decade. Well, it it relies on the United States Navy keeping the shipping lanes yeah. secure. I think that feels over. Yeah, that feels like it's it's got an expiration date. Um, I think what, like what all this red in, sea stuff. Yeah, and what comes all in the that, aftermath? Who knows? Yeah, is like is the wavering of all that it's sort of like the pullback because otherwise it's going to be i mean it seems like it's going back to east versus west is what it really seems like where like do you does it viable that you guys would maybe start getting your energy from someplace like russia too far away too far away yeah and the the biggest issue is if we were forced to produce our own oil our own like fuels for for vehicles um, is that we would produce very, very little diesel, like the heavy fuel that powers machinery that does agriculture and trucking and all of those vital functions. So we might be able to keep people driving around the suburbs if we've got our the refineries operating again um, to a limited degree. But see, here's the thing that I'm predicting for the whole world is that we'll probably have a long tail of oil production that it'll decrease for a relatively long period of time. The difficulty is going to be how the economic system and the political system responds to that change, because the, particularly the, the, the financial system has been built around the mathematics of growth, the idea that you, you invest and you get a certain percentage back, and there's like little ups and downs along the way, but it's relatively predictable. Um, that doesn't look like it's going to be compatible with a decreasing resource base. And in some ways, the financialization of the economy, like creating all of this debt and all of these instruments for investment that aren't really connected to anything physical is probably a way to try and keep the mathematics working a bit longer. Um, I suspect region by region, there's going to be uh, an abandonment of that financial system, which will probably be accompanied by shifting to a more an attempt at a more authoritarian type of government style. Yeah, but places like here and there, it's just not going to happen. You know, like Australia can probably authoritize the cities, but it's going to have trouble every place else. There's... Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the government needs that fuel to project its power into the hinterland. So that's and it's probably not going to be covered. worth it. You know, it's yeah. just not going to be worth the squeeze to go after the rednecks. Well, if you look at the history of civilizations going up and down, this is generally what happens. During the down phase, the centers of power concentrate on their productive hinterlands of keeping them under lock and key. But there'll be little tiny like mountain villages in a valley that's got a tiny pocket of fertile soil that end up relatively disconnected. And they have an opportunity to achieve some degree of independence. But if the bandits come knocking, they're on their own. So if they're too small to be viable to protect themselves, then they're possibly going to be wiped out. So yeah, it's do you do you want to live secure as a slave or do you want to live free as somebody who like sleeps with one eye open? Bring it on, man. I mean, I don't have to sleep with one eye open. Graham can stay up for a while.
And then well, again, it's, it's about while. culture and critical mass. You, you need to have enough of a pocket of isolated fertile soil to have enough of a population to maintain some complexity and coherence and critical mass for defense. Do you ever think about leaving Australia and, or, or you guess you're from there. It's hard. Like I have my home field advantage here. Do you have like a favorite country? If you could just magically transport everything someplace without cutting all your ties, would you? And at do this, you have a time Yeah. At now? this stage in my life, it doesn't make sense. I mean, in theory, I could sell the farm that I have for like bank because it's a huge property bubble here at the moment and go somewhere else and use the currency leverage to like live like a king. But I don't think I have enough years left on the clock to do anything with it other than sit around and get massages. And I, I don't <laughs> want, that's not my goal in life. I, I want to do something that has an interesting consequence. Like I want to be a catalyst for something bigger. That's um, funny, if that's I was in Australia in my twenties, like trying to get established um, with how crazy the economy is at the moment, I would definitely think about going somewhere else. And I, I mean, probably... just from a collapse perspective, though, just from like, like, the, you know, just like the lights are shutting off, everything's broken. Where yeah, is just like... economics and culture are, are dysfunctional here. So yeah, I could definitely see the incentive to do that. I would probably try and pick a country that is poor, that is relatively disconnected from the global system that like has never been that interesting. I mean, a really good example would be Bhutan. So it's up in the mountains. It's never been conquered. It has a really different way of doing governance. Um, and I'm not sure how willing they are for like, you know, 20 year old white people from Australia just turning up and saying, I want to live in Bhutan. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, what places are willing to accept people is a big issue as well. Um, I mean, there's a couple of pockets in South America, but the general pattern there is volatility. There's island nations, but anyone with a boat can just turn up and, and make trouble for them. Um, Highland Africa has a few interesting little pockets. But again, like the cultural barriers, the older you get in life, like learning a language. And here's the thing, if you're, in a, if you're a recent immigrant to a different culture and it starts becoming stressed, Usually what happens in a culture is that they look for scapegoats and you're more likely to be among the people who are targeted to be the ones. Yeah. To, and you if know, you can't speak the language very well or anything like that, then now you got real problems going on. You know, I could, mm -hmm. there's definitely something to home field advantage. I can't remember who said that, but we had a pass. You, you did. You did. Yeah. I don't think it was me. Yeah, it was you. You, you were talking about the home field advantage. Yeah. I think you, I you, you look at successful migration like that, and it's either one person who moves during a time of peace, marries a local, has a family, and even another generation passes. So they become relatively indistinguishable from the local population. Right. I don't think we have that much time on the clock anymore. Yeah. The alternative is you have a critical mass of people move all together. Um, and I mean, that happens a lot in history, but they tend to become a persecuted minority. So um, like if you can that. find I some, like if, if you can find something that you can offer the wider yeah. community that you can yeah. do that they value, you might have a chance. Yeah. But I mean, how many useful skills do people in the West have left that they can offer anymore? Yeah, yeah, I have a lot of useful skills. <laughs> DJs, fifteen dollars. HJs, ten dollars. Watch me touch it, three dollars. <laughs> I think uh, while you keep talking about not enough time, what's the timeline? And your, I'd like to hear your timeline. You know, I'll give you lots of leeway on this because I agree with you. I think it's Atlas Shrugged. Ayn Rand nailed it. We're kind of halfway through. Maybe we're a thousand pages before, but we're chipping off pages. I mean, I always say a thousand pages. It's got to be down to 900 by now. What's the timeline? And does that timeline differ depending on what part of the world you're in? So my gut feeling is that between here and the end of the century will be a decline of, I don't know, 50 to 90% of the global population. And so that's like three generations, I think, that we have left to go, three or four generations. And it's funny, you hear that statistic and your instant reaction is, oh, my God, there'll be bodies in the street. There'll be like massacres. It doesn't have to work like that. Um, so people's ability to understand the power of exponential growth is our, our intuitions are off. Like you actually go through the maths and you, nothing seems to happen. And then suddenly there's an explosion and everything changes when, when the curve suddenly goes up. The same thing happens for contraction. So this is a little thought experiment that I love running past people. 
at the moment, the global population has an annual 2% growth rate and 1% death rate. 2% birth, 1% death. So there's a net 1% growth rate in the population. And this has been happening for long enough that people just think that's normal. But what it means is every 70 years, you double the population on the planet. And can you imagine going from like 8 to 16 billion people, like how crazy things would get here in just 70 years? And that's the time scale I'm talking about. So flip that around. Imagine now instead we have a 2% death rate and a 1% birth rate every year. That's not Armageddon. It's just slightly different. Imagine you're in a village of 100 people and previously there were two babies and one funeral every year. Flip that around to two funerals and one baby. You'd barely notice the difference year to year. But if you are in a 1%... right now. Sorry? Arguably that's happening right now. Yeah, we, the, the demographic change is happening now and it's, yeah. it's going to be more than a 1% change per year. But you suddenly are going from doubling the population in 70 years to halving it in 70 years. No catastrophe needed. It's just a change in the dynamic. The big catastrophe is going to be for the economic system that manages everything that's built on the expectation of growth that's happened in the last 100 years. The growth is going to go away and we're not going to be able to paper it over anymore. Or maybe we will keep papering it over. Maybe we will be you know, spending trillion dollar uh, digital credits to buy like a sandwich and people just think that's normal. Well, they'll just come up with a new name for it, so it won't be like a trill. It'll be like a trilly, or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. Like, oh, I mean, yeah. this has happened before. Like there were, there's been governments that just added zeros to the ends of their dollars. That's kind of what Bitcoin's along. getting you ready for, my. You know, in a lot of ways, it's like you're working with transactions that are seven, or you know, I usually work with it's just point one four. You know, it's a tiny little fraction of a Bitcoin because you're going to be working with what is a tiny little fraction of a trillion, which is actually yep. like you know a seventy million dollar chocolate bar. But, uh, you know, so. And it's yeah. funny, I'm not completely unsympathetic to the elites that are trying to steer this like atom bomb that they're strapped to the front of. I like, don't think the they even knew they, they were with. I, I agree. I mean, I was just arguing with a guy in our Canadian roundup show the other day that I think they just kind of got footed with this thing. And they're just like, this is there's no way out of this thing. It's just it's a time bomb. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, here's the thing, like they've got unprecedented powers for um, cultural control and for financial control that they've never had before. Um, and they're going to need them to try and stop societies from tearing themselves apart. And so here's the thing, like the Roman Empire was relatively peaceful if you look at like the, the, the murder rate, um, but it was also very expensive that the people, the average people had to work their guts out to contribute resources to the central authority to keep the whole thing going. So there were many regions that when it collapsed, the individual people left behind were actually wealthier than they were during the time of Roman domination, um, but they had to deal with their own security. So there were other places that just went into complete bedlam and you know, <laughs> hordes of barbarians going around. Like it was just complete chaos. Yeah, but I don't know if it's, I, I flip flop back and forth all the time. I don't know if it would would be like that. I, you, you did a review of a book. Um, I can't remember the book's name now. I was going to write it down. I should have. But it was about the the leaving the the plants and the leaving nature alone, right? And how resilient it is, and how how it, it it always comes back if you leave it alone. But all our intervention that we do, and I feel like it's the same with these elites in humanity. Like the more you try and mess with it, the more it fucks things up. Like just let it be on its own in a way. And I think well, like nature will help humanity figure it out. It'll help the ordinary people. What I predict is going to happen with the elites is that these digital tools that they're using to create a kind of soft authoritarianism are going to work so well in the right locations that the elites are actually going to lose the skills for ruling without them. So that when the pipeline of like microchips from Taiwan eventually dries up because it's so complicated that it just needs one ingredient to be missing and the whole thing shuts down, when we finally lose access to these technologies, the elites are not going to know how to govern anymore. Right. And that's when we're going to be in danger of chaos. Right. Or, or the, uh, you know, a CME or the grid goes down or an, an EMP, uh, something that's going to like, we're so fragile now with our yeah. infrastructure basically too. There's no, yeah. there's no way they could, if, if, if things went down that unless they have a controlled demolition of it, um, there's no way they could maintain maintain their leadership i don't think yeah it, it's interesting so yeah i it's funny you hear you hear often that the elites are referred to as like predators or parasites 
yeah as, as a negative kind of thing like that they're they're like evil i actually still see them as predators and parasites but in a positive way that in ecology those species function to stabilize the rest of the system um, a, a really good example of this was the introduction of the potato into ireland so up until that point the english the horrible evil english had been extracting resources out of ireland and immiserating the population of peasants but keeping them relatively stable when the potato arrived because it could be grown underground it was and it couldn't be put on ships and taken back to england there was a population explosion in the peasants that the, the english just couldn't manage and that set up the conditions for the inevitable uh, pathogen to come in and wipe out the crop and cause this like huge catastrophe so in some ways the English were incompetent in their ability to manage that population, the next trophic level down in the society. They lost control of the ecosystem. So, um, and it and set up the conditions is, for a collapse. Control is more important than people want to take in because it's not important for everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm confident that Shane will do fine with no control factors in place. I'm confident <laughs> that Darren would do fine with no control factors. But Graham, I'm still on the fence, but he's trending in the right direction. But you know, when I when I walk through the mall, say if I have to go pick something up from Bass Pro, you know, I'm, when I'm looking around, it's like, you know, nine out of ten, nine out of ten need the control structure. They can't exist outside of it. I mean, I'm not trying to be a dick or NPC or this and that. It's just if they don't have the grocery store, if so many, if if enough levels of convenience are taken out of the thing then either A, they're not going to live, which is drastic, but B, they're, which isn't drastic, is they're, and it's happening already in the in monetary form, is they're not going to reproduce or they're not going to reproduce enough. Yeah, yeah. Um, nope. it, it, it's interesting because I think at least Western countries have the capacity for a couple of generations of soft authoritarianism linked to rationing. So the amount that we consume at the moment is this huge amount of fat that can be trimmed back and still leave enough resources for survival. Um, places like, you know, Haiti, where they were importing cheap industrial grains to like support, barely support their population, they didn't have that buffer. So when but, they... But, but if they were responsible for their own resources and they got the money, but like, I feel like this, I want to tease out that good parasitic part of it. I like, I like what you're saying there. It's interesting, but... I feel like they've they've messed the system up to the point where it, it wouldn't now it can't function on its own without this. So so give me an example of something that they're they're uh, they're creating balance on. Um, well, I mean, in the West, for example, the this demographic collapse is unfolding. Like the the reproduction rates of young people. Yeah, but that's their I, fault, though. I mean, this this is what I'm getting at, right? Like but, we're not. I don't see that as a problem. I see it as one of the better pathways to reducing yeah, yeah, the yeah. population without yeah. having to have absolute, you know, massacres or, I mean, it, even pandemics are, are likely in the future if we can't maintain people's health. Right, we, right, right. Like it's not yeah, just starvation. Not the, it, it, it's vigorous. Mm. You have to be vigorous. Yeah, you have to have but, enough food resources to be able to fight off infections. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, hmm. Yeah, I guess I just don't see overpopulation being a problem yet, as as you do. Like, I I don't see that. I see it being an unnatural. Well, you might have to get dropped into the middle of India before you make that decision, or you know, like because India and China are footing most of the bill on overpopulation. I mean, we're in Canada. There's no, we have zero overpopulation problem, in and even in the USA, maybe parts of Mexico, but I mean, I I don't see an overpopulation problem either and then i went to cairo and i was like holy fuck man how do you people live like this now it, it depends on mean, what resources you're talking around. about and and funnily enough i think food isn't necessarily the most it isn't always going to be the most critical resource going forwards um if we need to go back to using firewood for cooking and heat right right um you look at the landscape yeah. in the 1800s yeah. around those early settler towns they're a moonscape. They cut down right. every tree yeah, to, yeah. to, you know, build houses, function. There's yeah. been regrowth since it's been abandoned yeah, in a lot yeah. of those places, but they're low quality trees. If you wanted to build a house out of them, 
you would struggle compared to the people who like just had to get one huge log. Right. Yeah. That's a good, so there's a good, there's a great point right there. Like, you know, over, over Mm -hmm. uh, forestation in certain spots. And so, but cause you've done the calculations right in your own experimental farm, Mm -hmm. uh, you've done the calculations, like my effort versus output, like, is that enough to sustain me? I mean, and that's, it's, so you're it's coming really from you're coming from a scientific like standpoint of like, how can I make enough food resource for myself without relying on industrial inputs? That's the, that's the tricky on the part. Yeah, and this is a process. So, firstly, permaculture, you know, grow your own, all of that stuff, has a problem with being fixated on vegetables and fruits, which makes perfect sense when you're living in the suburbs and you've only got a small area to grow because the quality and the monetary return on investment and the interest in it, all of those point towards fruits and veggies. But the problem is they only make up like 10% of the human diet. Most of it is staple calories that come from carbohydrates, that come from grains or roots or things like that. And a lot of these people in the suburbs are like, I'll just grow more potatoes, it'll be fine. But if you actually sit down and do the numbers, the amount of reasonable quality land that you need to grow those potatoes for one person is completely impossible in the suburbs that we have, even the relatively widely spread out American suburbs. Um, So a really good example of this, um, there's a book I did a review on called Farmers for 40 Centuries. So an American agronomist traveled through Southeast Asia in the late 1800s and documented how that pre-industrial agriculture was working. And the smallest area of staple crops per person anywhere in the world before we had all of these chemicals to like bump things up was in Japan where you needed one third of an acre of double cropped paddy rice per person. And who has a third of an acre of land that fertile per person? Um, There's logistical issues as well too. If you grow potatoes, you need to be able to store them to supply food throughout the year. Grains have the advantage that if you know how to dry and store them, you can Um, create a buffer to get you through the ups and downs in production. Potatoes are only a reliable year-round crop in a really small number of places that are consistently warm and rainy throughout the whole year, places like Ireland. But um, they're a really rare kind of location. Um, In most of the US, you're frozen for like half of the year. So are you saying without mass monocrops and and, and mass, uh, what's the word for those big... Staple crops, the, the and and the and the the cow the uh, the meat farms and all the meat uh, what are they called mm. the, the industrial oh, the farms and all that yeah and and with all the fake food like we couldn't you don't think we could make without zero it would be hard to do zero input to well look at it this way before we added industrial inputs into the agriculture system we sustained about six hundred million people worldwide okay. for thousands of years that was the limit that we hit. Places that had really good soil tended to become limited in firewood or water, and you built up enough population that you ended up with epidemics, like knocking the population back down. Everywhere else, you had marginal agriculture that supported much lower population densities. And without the ongoing industrial inputs, we are likely to return to something like that 600 million people, which is about a 90% drop. Wow, and that's, what, probably, and that's what those people like Jane Goodall and uh, who else has, has said that they need to be at that 500 million, <laughs> that 500 yeah, and million level. I mean, I don't think any government has to have a plan to do it. No, I think no, it's no, going to no, happen no. gradually and spontaneously yeah. over the next four generations. So, so what are some of the inputs that, what are, are the inputs that we do? Like, what are you talking about like uh, water, irrigation? Um, yeah, irrigation is um, a huge one. In- I would point out that irrigation and water supply for suburbs is also critical. And those water systems were built mostly in like the post-World War II era and they're falling apart. Like look at the US water infrastructure, the resources to repair and maintain that are going to go away. They are going away. Um, Some places are going faster than others. But if you want to pack people in together and them not get dysentery, you need to have a water and a sewage system. Um, Just like a a feedlot for for cattle, you you need to have water troughs and some form of, you know, sludge removal. They they pour it into giant lagoons. But what else for agriculture, agriculture, though? Um, So the other big one is phosphorus. So the early stage of industrialization before we had, like, Uh, diesel powered machinery we had horse-drawn farm implements using cheap iron and we boosted yields by mining guano phosphorus 
from islands that had had birds on them for like millions of years and shipping it around the world with coal. So phosphorus in many places was the limiting resources on particular as, types as of a, soils. As a fertilizer? As a fertilizer, yes. Um, and we're hitting phosphorus limits with, uh, you know, diesel powered machinery, digging up even bigger deposits. There's, there's only a couple of places around the world where you get large phosphorus deposits. And we're pouring so much of it on places like Idaho and uh, the giant cornfields out there that it's washing into the oceans and like polluting the whole of the Caribbean. So that resource is limiting in most places when you don't have it on hand in a bag to just sprinkle it out the back of a machine. Can you, can you talk about your maze uh, experiment? Oh, of course, of course. So, um, example, right, of what, how you're calculating this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was one of the recent posts that I did. So I'm in a subtropical climate that is often really, really wet. And during those times, weeds grow like crazy. And at other times, we get really prolonged droughts where just nothing grows for like a year. And it flips back and forth between those states. Um, which makes agriculture really, really challenging because um, the emergence of complex civilization built on agriculture probably relied on regions that had reliable cycles of wet and dry. I mean, look at Egypt with the Nile flooding exactly the same time every year. That was, a, that was on easy mode. Um, when you come to somewhere like Australia's wheat belt, we'll get rain for three years and then we'll get a flood and then we'll get a drought for five years. If you wanted to drop a medieval village in the middle of that and create a granary, I mean, good luck. The, the droughts are going to be so long that there's no way you can store enough grain to get you through those periods. Um, and for this reason, I view maize as a minor crop for me. It, it's useful to get the genetics while I can. Maybe it'll be more useful for other people in different places and times in the future. But that's the first issue I have. If I can't plant a crop by a particular time in summer because we're having a drought year, there's just no crop that year. That's about 20 to 30% of the time. The season's just gone which I think is a bit too high for it to be the main staple for us. Okay, so flip around. The other issue is how do you prepare the land to get the crop growing? Because if you've got weeds that are chest deep, you can't just plant the crop into that. So rather than physically removing all of those weeds every time I want to plant a crop, I've uh, tapped into what's called an Inga Alley system. So this was developed in Central America to replace shifting slash and burn agriculture that they do up in the rainforests. So the traditional system there is that you cut all the rainforest down, you burn it, and then you grow your maize crop in that weed-free, high nutrient residue. And after you grow that crop, you let it go back to rainforest for like 20 years before you think about doing it again. Um, with the current population densities, it's not possible to rest the land for long. So this institution developed a system of planting a fast-growing legume tree in these dense alleys and when they're still immature, they canopy over and all of the weeds underneath them die. And when you want to grow a crop, you cut that tree back and it produces all of the biomass, which contains the nutrient for the crop. So I've been implementing that here in Australia. I think I'm the first person here doing it because um, the ice cream bean tree had been introduced and people were demonizing it as like this weedy, horrible thing. It's relatively well behaved in my region, but some other places nearby, it's a bit worse. But anyway, so I've been doing this for about 10 years now and experimenting with how to grow maize as the main calorie crop in amongst this uh, ice cream bean tree, this inga tree that provides the weed control and the fertilizer and firewood as well. Like if you want to eat the maize at the end, you need a source of wood that's reliable so that you can you can cook it. And the last season, I, I wrote this on my Substack as a post, I analyzed how many days worth of energy I put into establishing all of that versus how many days worth of energy I got back in the form of maize. And it was actually slightly less than one on one. I invested, I think, 16 days worth of work and I got 11 days worth of calories back. So at this stage in my life, I'm not determined to scale everything up to the point that I'm producing all of my calories. I would wear my body out so quickly. Like I'm, I, I grew up in the suburbs. I, I don't have that peasant uh, connective tissue strength that comes from doing agriculture from like the day that you can walk. <laughs> um, but I am very focused on coming up with crops that do give you more return than you put into them, that you could actually use that as a foundation for a local agricultural society. And I'll, I mentioned this in the post that I made a, several mistakes with the crop this year and that I could have got as high as I think three or four um, times return on the energy invested, which is enough for subsistence. Oh, so okay. I need to get so, better so, at yeah. not making those mistakes. So it could have. So you could have got 
could have got more. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did, does this make you think at all about like an ideal kind of like tribal quality quantity of people or like a zone of community that you could all sort of, you know, trade labor, even if you, when you need to sort of, you know, push something out, you could, you could combine your labor, you know, like the, kind of like the self-sufficient sort of farm community feel like, do you, do you have like an idea now of how, how many people and I how wide of a range? I have an ideal, but there is no way that you can convince people today that it's worth spending 16 days of labor to grow. I think what ended up being about $10 worth of corn. If you'd bought the industrial equivalent from the shop, like the, the, that's less than, you know, oh, no, not vision. for corn, but for, for everything, for everything. Yeah. yeah. Um, so my current focus is still gathering the genetics that, and trialing and proving the genetics that works under my local conditions. Um, when I get too old to do that, when my body's not strong enough, um, sorry, during this initial phase, I'm also sharing all of the genetics that's showing promise with everyone in Australia that's interested. Like I'm, I'm selling it for far less, less than it's worth. Um, and again, people are comparing the prices I sell seeds for with the industrial seeds that you can buy at like the mega supermarket that were produced in a greenhouse and like struggled to grow outside in real soil. Um, so that's the current phase in my life. And I'm very cognizant that I've, I'm not going to convince anyone to be a madman like me and spend 16 days growing $10 worth of corn. Like it, it, nobody's going to do that. I'm hopeful that when I get to the older stage of my life, I can shift to building community and sharing the resources and making sure that they continue after I'm gone because it's very, very easy to lose this genetics. And once it's gone, it's almost impossible to replace. I mean, these locally adapted varieties used to be all over the world. Every little village would have their own strain of wheat, their own strain of corn. And um, anytime you get a flood of industrial product coming in, that's, you know, 1% the price of the local sustainably produced product, there's just no way it can compete. So the lines end up being lost. So well, restoring them is, is a big effort. Because, yeah, you've mentioned them. And instead of making the land changing the land to make it work for stuff you think you're supposed to grow, mm. keeping the land as it is and grow what's supposed to grow there. Yeah. Well, how how yeah. does somebody like Darren, if Darren wanted to make a food forest or, or, you know, in, in his property or me in my backyard, like how do you figure out what's supposed to be there? So what, the first what, what thing would I would recommend without changing the land too much, you know? Yeah. So the first thing is to source genetic diversity of crops that have a reasonable chance of doing well in your local ecosystem. Um, so if you have a history of agriculture, they would have tried everything already. So you'll at least know, oh, this is a wheat belt, like wheat does well here. But around you is probably being grown industrial wheat that produces huge yields, but it needs all of these inputs that aren't going to be sustainable. So the key is to cast as wide a net as possible to source these pre-industrial wheat genetics grow them all side by side, let them cross-pollinate each other, and then start selecting out the varieties that perform the best on your particular patch of land and start recreating this patchwork of genetic diversity that is a lived experience in the ecosystem around you. Um, and if you still have a partially selected, highly diverse, like hybrid swarm, when the climate starts changing, it's going to be in more of a position to change along with it. Those are great answers. Yeah. Darren, Darren, do you have anything? No, I'm, I don't see myself planting much. You know, I got plenty of Saskatoons growing all over the place here. And, I, you know, I'm a predator. I'd probably take on some cows maybe, but I mean, I'd more likely just hop on my horse and go shoot something. My, my personal pick going forward, the, the animal that's probably going to be the most useful is the dairy goat. So I have dairy goats and the energetic analysis of them blows everything else out of the water. Wow. I was going to ask you why you had all the goats. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're because they're smaller than cows, talking? they reproduce more quickly and it's easier to adjust their populations up and down. Like the scalability of a solution is a big issue. And I think this I is a big like reason why tree crops aren't a huge priority because the, the time scales to increase the generations are so slow that it's always going to be a marginal kind of thing. And when you have a disaster in a tree crop, it takes you generations to like build it all back up again. And you're going to starve in the meantime, whereas annual crops and livestock, like small livestock, like goats that produce a continuous high quality calorie and protein, like the fat and the protein that comes out of goat is like nothing else. Um, and the resource that's likely to be available for them in the future, all of this abandoned land that's turning back into weeds and shrubs 
is the perfect thing for goats to turn into food for humans. Huh. Interesting. What do you feed your dogs? There's a question in the chat. <laughs> um, so my dogs are only half sustainable. Um, their diet is half yogurt from the goats and they get half a kibble mix as well huh. that I buy. So here's the weird thing. Like this was a classic thing when we first moved onto the farm and got the dairy goats. Our first Christmas, I sat down and I had a bowl of homemade zero input goat milk chilled in a refrigerator like powered with coal and I poured cocoa pops on top of it. And, and it, that just symbolized where we are in history. So we are still very much in the middle of a global industrial system. And the idea that we can just like snap our fingers and wave a magic wand and turn back into 16th century peasants is a fantasy. We can't do that now, but we can gather the resources that people will use to reclaim comparable lifestyles in the future. Right. So you use, you use whole, whole goat milk then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, They're we mostly turn it into yogurt. That's my favorite. Very nutritious compared very to nutritious. pasteurized milk. Uh, I have some of it raw, um, but yeah, the the goat is uh, the yogurt is effectively pasteurized too. It makes it a bit more digestible, a bit more stable. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, and yeah, we process our own animals, so probably a third to a half of our meat comes from our goats because there's always too many. Um, and again, like I'm functioning like a a king, like an aristocrat, I'm managing my goat peasants because if I just let them breed and go everywhere, the population is going to get so big that either wild dogs are going to come in and do the job for me or some disease is going to break out when they start experiencing nutritional stress. So I'm I'm constantly acting as a, as, as a balancer for that, the, that productive life power. How many acres? We have 40 acres. The goats regularly graze about 10 of them. They get moved every few days. Um, I use mobile electric fencing to do that now. Um, if I had to do it myself without all of that technology, I would need to be out there herding them for about four hours a day, take them out twice a day. When we have droughts, that 10 acres isn't enough to sustain the herd. So I also have fodder trees planted all over the place that I cut branches for to get them through the droughts. Wow. I feel like I could have so many goats running around here because I, we're pulling, there's pulling enough hay off the the 50 acres by the lake now to feed the six or seven horses all winter. Mm -hmm. Cause that's like, so what are you doing in the winter? Are you pulling hay for the winter for you don't have winter? We don't have winter. We're <laughs> kind of like Northern Florida is our climate. So we get a touch of frost occasionally. Um, our, our, off season is late is spring is relatively dry and occasionally we get a drought that goes through into summer um so yeah we, we don't have the the challenges with having to put up hay i would so that, the drought you to look at tree hay as an alternative to annual hay if you can establish banks of trees that maintain some leaves in the winter which i think you have some species well i've got um, and you can also cut I've got yeah, you can also cut um, summer leaves off trees and dry them and use them as hay as well. Oh, interesting. My my horses are always eating the leaves for sure because mm. I've got, you know, 20, 15 or 20 acres, well, maybe 15 acres of trees on the property. Mm. So then they're all growing tons of leaves. So is it, it's worth bagging all those leaves, I guess. It would be the same as, as rolling hay. That's just as valuable of a resource. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you get kindling at the same time. I have so much deadfall to start chopping up and just, I'm just going to pile it. My plan is just pile it wherever it lies right now, but there's probably a hundred cords of wood on the ground in and amongst the property right now. Yep. It's fucking see, nuts. See, this is the interesting thing. If you take away the diesel and the machinery, you very quickly get back to a manpower limitation to anything that you want to do, um, particularly transportation. Like that's the, that's the circulatory system of the the global squid. Um, and it's another choke point that's potentially going to, you know, have a stroke or a heart attack, uh, at least that's in, why. on a regional basis. That's why I want it all chopped up, even if it's off, you know, in the back 40, but it's just, okay, there's three deadfall here, pile them up right here, and they're in, you know, 18 inch, because now I just got to split them. I'm not like trying to axe a tree down into pieces and, you know, it becomes a real... But I'm, I, dude, I got like a wood furnace stash just in case. I'm, I'm very well prepared for this bitch to come down. I like <laughs> winter because it means I'll have to less shoot less people trying to steal my shit. 
<laughs> um, so as an example, I'm building an outdoor wood-fired kitchen at the moment for storing food and like cooking large batches of things and drying food because it's usually wet here during the middle of a um, harvest season. So being able to dry fruit would be an amazing advantage. But for powering that, um, I've got all of these support trees that I can cut for wood, but I don't want to do a huge amount of cutting. And a lot of it is really like twiggy, awkward material that's awkward to bring back to burn. So my plan is to cut those trees on a whole branch scale and then burn the wood in the location and convert it into charcoal because that's a much higher energy density. It's easier to handle it, like it's already broken up into small pieces. And I'm in the process of getting a couple of donkeys to help me cart that material in bulk back to the wood-fired kitchen. What about, uh, so how, what are you doing? How much solar do you need to run your well? Um, so we are running our water system off the roof. So in Australia, we generally have water tanks and we've, we've got so much stored. In a, in a distant post-industrial future, when you don't have the pumps and you don't have the plastic tanks or the metal tanks, you would have to go back to the tradition of hauling water from local water bodies. And we've, we've got relatively limited surface water in Australia. We have a boundary creek, but during a drought, it turns into like a, a muddy puddle. What about just to, like, I've got a well. I mean, I obviously my pump, pumps aren't going to work if the power goes out, but the solar seems to be almost to the point where you could be pulling up water most of the time. Yeah, again, that's a great solution for the next generation or th maybe three, depending on how stable things stay in different regions. But at some point that really, really complicated, fragile technology is probably not going to be sustained anymore. So keeping a mind to looking forward to how humans could occupy the landscape differently, I, I think is an important skill. I mean, Australia, our semi-arid regions, which would be amazing for nomadic uh, societies in the future, they're currently all just like mega um, barbed wire cattle farms. Um, they all rely on tapping into our artesian like water supply, like our groundwater. Um, how sustainable that's going to be in the long term, who knows? It, it's interesting because when you have a technology, there's always going to be one potential choke point. So um, a, a really good example of this is in Australia and the Americas before Europeans turned up, the technology for chopping wood, for chopping trees was really, really limited. So you could use a stone axe. Um, there were copper axes, I think, in some parts of the US as well for a little while until they exhausted the resource. But cutting a tree with those techniques limits how big the tree can be, particularly if you have no bison or, or like uh, uh, steers, like cattle, for dragging those logs to a location to use them. Like there's a limit to how big uh, uh, a piece of wood humans can move around. So really interesting story. In my region, when the first uh, timber getters turned up, they went to the local uh, Indigenous people and said, oh, we'll, we'll give you, we'll trade you a metal axe or a metal cooking pot or a knife if you show us where the really good trees are that we're looking for, like these particular types of trees. And the Aborigines are like, sure, that's, that's a really amazing tool. That'll make our life so much easier. And they took them to one by one to all of these giant old growth trees that got cut down by these new metal tools that the Aborigines never had the tools to cut down before. Um, a train line was put through to my town and all of these trees were sent to London. Like there's docks in London that were built with trees from my backyard. And eventually all the trees were gone and the, the whole economy of the, the town collapsed and we're like a ghost town now. We're, we're just the remnants that's turning into suburbia. But my point is, the idea that these indigenous people had this like painting with the colors of the wind and like worshiping these giant trees is bullshit. They didn't have the technology to now allow them to exploit them. And um, as soon as they were introduced to that new technology, they started using it in much the same way that the evil Western people did. I mean, look at all of the, um, the fur hunters and trappers in North America that were using rifles supplied by the Westerners that were used to like wipe out beavers and completely transform ecosystems. Oh, they didn't wipe out the beavers. Trust me. There's plenty of fucking beavers running around this motherfucker. Maybe not in Louisiana anymore. I heard they sold Louisiana based on how many beavers were in it. Mm. That was the, uh, the factory used to figure that out. Well, Shane, this has been fantastic. Time flies. 
when you're having fun. We'll have to do this again down the down the road as long as the technology. Sure thing. I love cool, talking bro. civilization. Should I, should I plug my stuff? Yeah. yeah sure. where, where can people find everything? <laughs> and, and your okay, book so, too, your, and your yeah, upcoming book. book so you know. three ways you can, well, four ways you can find me. So the first easiest way, I have a podcast that I talk to amateur plant breeders all around the world doing similar work to me called the Going to Seed Podcast that comes out every two weeks, twice a month. I also have a Substack called Zero Input Agriculture, where every week I put a post up detailing, like in detail, the experiments that I'm doing on the farm, sometimes book reviews, sometimes a bit of philosophy, a little bit of fiction in there too. The third thing that's coming out, which I'm really excited is a book, a short book called Taming the Apocalypse. So, and it's an, it's an investigation into the power of hands-on biotechnology to lead humanity through the crisis ahead of us to entirely new forms of civilization. Um, it's more like a manifesto than an almanac, but it also features a survey of the entire tree of life for domestication potential that we just haven't tapped into yet. Um, so all sorts of fun things in there. And the final thing, if you're interested in my fiction, I have written a series of four novellas that make one big chunky novel called Our Vitreous Womb. It's a hard biological science fiction set in a distant future where society is built entirely on biological technology. So there's no rocket ships, there's no robots, there's no computers, there's no gleaming laboratories. It's all just biology. And I've built like a whole civilization with characters like, you know, finding their way through that new kind of uh, lifestyle. Awesome. Oh, and it's published under the name Haldane B. Doyle. Uh, I've got Very a website, nice. uh, author website for that too. So I'll, I'll send you all the links so that you can post them up. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, thanks. This was a blast. Absolutely. Well, when, this I, has been great. We're living at a really exciting time in history where small things that we do now have the potential of growing into like whole new systems and ecosystems and cultures and civilizations just based on one little tiny experiment that we do today. Yeah. I like that. Well said. Thank you. Absolutely. This has been good. This has been great. Hopefully it sticks around. I mean, I think we got some time, but I can go either way. I mean, I'm Mad Max does excite me. I do. I get excited by the idea of, you know, just I, the whole thing just sort of excites me. Just possibilities. Like yeah, the time when down. there were cowboys and samurais on the earth, earth right. at the same time, and you could get a steamship and a train to go from one to the other. Exactly. Like, and if you step yeah. on my property, I can shoot you. That too. That's a, <laughs> you know, like no one's telling me I have to get a shot or anything like that. I said, what? What? You better turn around and keep on walking, boy. You know, I could get into, we, we came a little too far maybe, but I still want the internet because it, you know, pays for my life. So that's <laughs> kind of nice. Shane, this has been fantastic. We will have to do this again come back anytime and have i guess it's uh, still early over there tomorrow so have a great tomorrow brilliant thank you very much yeah, yeah. and that was our chat with dr shane simonson taming the apocalypse what'd you think oh it was a blast i love it yeah it was really good Everyone. kind of made me look at things a little bit differently too with population and resources and stuff it's good well, and then they got this, the j j b jabbers in there to help accelerate that to maybe a four to one, you know? And then all of a sudden, in two generations, you're down to that number. Maybe I should have another kid. Anyway, how long do I think we have? Uh, I don't know. I, I We probably have longer than we think, honestly. It's just going to get harder stuff. going to get harder to get, the more intricate stuff. So you might want to figure some of that stuff out, I guess. But I think we got some time, but I live my life like we don't. And I prepare like we don't. If I have an idea of something that I think I should get for my prepping, it becomes like, it's not a next year or this or that. It's usually like, okay, as soon as I can get that shit together. And if I, you know, if it's not super expensive, if it's something I can just do right away, then I, I tend to just do it right away. Pow. Okay. Like, you know, we figured out the canning and the tallow and all that sort of stuff. Cause there's so many cows running around this bitch that at least for my generation, I could just be wrangling up wild cows for the foreseeable future. I be think like a real cowboy five or 6 million head of cattle roaming around Alberta. And if all this shit turns back to grassland then I can't see how all the like, cause you know, all the city people will be dead. 
and uh, a lot of other people. And I just think that uh, by the when we do get to those further out generations, when the stuff really starts breaking down, there's going to be so many antelope and deer and everything running around again that that maybe we can hopefully because I I'm a firm believer that we're meant to eat the things that are eating the grass. Not I'm not interested in eating grass or grass by i do eat vegetables you know i think i have to have broccoli tonight i don't mind broccoli but i don't think i need broccoli to survive i think i can survive off of uh fat and things and i think that you know maybe run into a vitamin c problem but i think you could offset that with those little red things that sean is always collecting make some juice out of them or something i don't know i mean you did the carnivore i think you could just go on forever like that yeah probably yeah, yeah. anyway Big thanks to Shane for coming on the show. Big thanks to you guys for listening. Even bigger thanks if you are one of the few who choose to support the work here so that we can keep doing this kind of stuff. If you're getting some value from the show, I mean, a great chat with Shane. Probably added some value to your life. If you did get a little value, send some value back our way. This is a lot of work, a lot of effort, a decade and more of bringing out these shows all the time, working seven days a week. Go to america.ca slash support. If you can, when you can, sign up for a monthly or make a one-time donation, uh, and it'll be super helpful. It'll be valuable, makes us feel loved, and uh, helps us keep the lights on. we got carbon tax and everything else up here in Canada. It's getting crazy. So, grandamerica.ca slash support if you can. When you can, if you guys like audiobooks, head over to adultbrain.ca and check all that stuff out. There's YouTube, there's podcasts, there's Spotify, there's Audible, you name it. And grandamericaoutlaw.ca for all the sort of racy stuff that Society doesn't want us talking about too much. And there's outlawed Canadians for all the Canadian stuff. Other than that, we love you guys. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week.